self-government means that we will take care of the resources and we will take care of the land and the water and the air. In our wildest dreams, we can't do any worse than what has happened in the last 125 years. From Ottawa, Redefining Canada, the First Peoples and the Constitution, with Don Newman and Wendy Mesley. Good evening from Parliament Hill in Ottawa, the site this weekend of the Extra Constitutional Conference. That's right, Don, Constitutional Conference number six. This one devoted exclusively to Aboriginal constitutional issues. And you know, Wendy, the conference had to be the end of a spectacular week for the major Aboriginal organizations. Starting back on Tuesday, when the House of Commons passed a resolution recognizing Métis Louis Riel as one of the founders of the province of Manitoba. Powerful recognition indeed for a man who was hanged for treason in 1885. Then, beyond that symbolism, on Thursday, all of the major Aboriginal groups got what they wanted. An invitation to take part as full partners with the federal government and all of the provinces but Quebec in a 10-week process to try and find a constitutional consensus. And then this conference, this was first agreed to at the last weekend conference, or it was supposed to be the last, in, uh, in Vancouver last month. Originally, a lot of the Native leaders didn't want to participate in this process. They wanted a parallel process. And then they saw how well a number of other groups did in advancing their causes at other weekend conferences and said that they wanted one as well. And so they ended up getting what they wanted here this weekend, a platform, and started off with some strong words from some of the key participants. Let's take a look at that. Intentionally or unintentionally, with malice or without, the identity and culture and confidence and dignity of Aboriginal people were ground down. There are people here tonight who were taken away to schools and were told to despise their language, their culture. It's not that we want to resurrect the past in its entirety, but what we're seeking is the recognition of these pre-existing rights, the acceptance of white society of our people on our terms. Getting the message out and influencing public opinion. That's why the Aboriginal leadership wanted to have the conference this weekend. And for the first two days of the conference, that's just what they tried to do. Here's Bill Casey. Aboriginal leaders wanted this conference to keep up the pressure on the federal government to make sure the government understands that in this constitutional round, native issues have to be addressed. And if the supreme law is amended, to respect the Aboriginal people of Canada and the country called Canada will be complete. The Micmac version of the national anthem had hardly faded away when delegates turned to the major issue of the conference, the demand for the recognition of an inherent native right to self-government. Uh, an elder, when asked what self-government meant, replied very simply that self-government means minding your own business. And it's that simple. The idea of inherent right to self-government, the Aboriginal rights of people, is uh, one that is a, what you call a full box. Everything is in there. and. Uh, that's the approach we take. It's not one that's empty. And you, it, it only has something thrown in there if we can convince the federal government or the provincial government. The view is it's a full box. It, so when you talk about jurisdiction and authority, we start from the assumption that Aboriginal people have full jurisdiction, full authority over themselves. Some delegates didn't see a need to go beyond the acceptance of the principle of native self-government at this time. I don't care how the Aboriginals will obtain consent for constitutional amendments. I don't care if it's a simple majority or a full consensus. I don't care how the Aboriginals will administer their own program. I don't care how the Aboriginals resolve their internal differences. That's their problem. A member of the Native Council of Canada said embracing Native self-government would simply mean that Canada would become a country based on truth. Yes, it will affect your parliamentary system, it will affect your your two people founding nation concept, and yes, it will affect your two level of government concept and, and, and system. Yes, it will affect all of that. But isn't it worthwhile to finally have a country 
where the people, the original people, the first people who were there will finally have a place. A say in the, the, and running their own destiny, isn't that worthwhile? I think we have responsibility to ourselves and to this country to be precise and clear what we're talking about. But not all the aboriginals felt that just demanding self-government was good enough. This northern Quebec delegate said the Canadian public expected more. Whoever we deal with, whether it's a Government of Canada project, or under the ground land, or the provincial ground land, we have to talk about revenue sharing. That is a part of financial base for your self-government. You also have to be prepared to tax your own people. You have to be prepared to tax corporations. You have to be prepared whatever the activity is taking place within your region. So you have to have taxation power through a formulation of legislation. For Métis, this conference was another opportunity to appeal for respect, not just from non-Aboriginals, but from other Native groups as well. And I'm concerned, uh, therefore, that, uh, that Indian people would be suggesting that there be different classes of Aboriginal people, or that we should be uh, treated differently somehow today because we have been treated badly in the past. The Métis want the same constitutional rights as Indians and Inuit, including self-government, but they have no land of their own, and the federal government has never recognized any responsibility for them. And they're reminded they don't have treaties, like many Indian bands. In order to go into Confederation with Canada, we agreed with the federal crown in return for coexistence, in return for land, that we would share the land in return for those rights. And that goes beyond what other Aboriginal people are. We were the ones that were able to cross both cultures, the Indian and the white, but we always were never ever accepted by either the Indian or the white. We have walked a separate, lonely, isolated walk of life. One of the so-called ordinary Canadians at the conference said he was upset at the vagueness of native claims and the signs of internal division. So my first uh, word of advice is that um, is you'd better get your act together and start agreeing among yourselves. But if you don't, I'm afraid you're never going to sell the idea out there among those who don't even, don't even uh, come close to, to where I stand. But Zebedee Nungak had a comeback for non-Aboriginals who say that natives don't have their act together. I can't believe that the people who um, put their energy and their money into these sorts of gatherings are doing it with a polyglot collection of incoherent non-entities who have absolutely no sense of order. And by the end of the conference's second day, most Native leaders appeared to be satisfied that their basic constitutional demand was gaining ground. I've been wandering around all these different workshops, sitting in in the back, whether you've seen me or not, ready to fight with you if you disagree on an inherent right to self-government. But I getting kind of bored. <laughs> You know, Wendy, by the end of the second day of the conference, some of the Aboriginal leaders thought they were getting their message out so well that the inherent right to self-government for Aboriginal Canadians was now being recognized across the country, much the way Quebec as a distinct society, they think, is being recognized across the country, without either of them being clearly defined. There are those words again, distinct society. They always create uh, somewhat of a controversy in the, contra in the constitutional debate. Uh, we first saw the link between Aboriginal groups and distinct society back in Toronto at another constitutional conference several weeks ago. Aboriginal groups saying if Quebec was distinct, then they should be distinct too. But of course, Quebec saying, uh, if you want to be called that, fine, but, but couldn't you think of somewhat different words? Those are our words. Well, the controversy or the debate uh, came up again today on the last day of the conference. And uh, Bill Casey has another report on that. At the final conference workshop, the topic was how should First Peoples be recognized in the Constitution? It didn't take long for those words to come up. 
Est-ce que c'est d'une nécessité absolue d'utiliser ces mots? Is it absolutely necessary to use those words? Those words, of course, are distinct society. Quebec delegate Jocelyn Dufour couldn't understand why native groups are insisting on using the same term that his province claims for itself. Some natives wondered why not. It's my understanding as a, as a fact of history that Quebec was not always married to the term distinct society. At one point, their terminology was they wanted particular status. How do you explain that inconsistency? Now it's distinct society. Before it was particular status. This Inuit representative said his people are prepared to be flexible. We will look at other language. Uh, we will compare that language when we see in the Constitution that our rights will not be eroded by other people's rights being put in. And if the language can determine that there is no distinction, then we are prepared to take a serious look at that. But Liberal MP Ethel Blonda insisted that Quebec's before explain why distinct society should be off limits to Aboriginals. Why are you alleging that we're almost distinct but not quite distinct, that we should use other words? If we really are distinct and you really mean it substantively, why quibble about words? What is it going to do to Quebec to recognize Aboriginal people as being distinct? Before I assure Blonde that other acceptable words can be found for natives. Il y a trois problèmes actuellement. As you are no doubt aware, there are three issues in the province of Quebec at the moment as perceived by the government, included in the Baudouin Dolly Commission. There is, of course, the division of powers, but there is, of course, this whole issue of distinct society. So, therefore, uh, I merely want to repeat what I said a moment ago. There's probably a way of expressing what you are, what you see, in a wording that would be totally different. I'm convinced that this is possible. A former Supreme Court Chief Justice who advised the Prime Minister on the terms of reference for a Royal Commission into Aboriginal Affairs sided with Quebec on this issue. I am inclined to uh, lend support to Mr. Dufour because the distinct society, I think, to most Canadians who've read the newspapers over the last months, if anybody mentions distinct society, immediately thinks of the problems of Quebec and it's... Uh, it's no copyright on that particular phrase, but uh, I think it cannot be denied that it has become, in the current language, political language of Canada, something that uh, relates to the ongoing discussion with the problems of Quebec. Jeez, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't want to be the spoiler, and, and I appreciate everything you've said, Justice Dixon, and I'm sure there are a few in Canada that would disagree with you, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't. They have the right to disagree. I don't. I don't. I, I know as a judge, you you uh, defend my right to disagree with you. <laughs> Blonda said Aboriginal groups are looking for the full protection of their distinct languages and cultures. What we are asking for is the respect, the basic decency that we have fought so hard for in this country. That's what we're asking for. We're not asking for a diminution or disrespect of Quebec's languages and cultures. We're asking just for the basic recognition and a decency that we deserve as equal human beings. That's all. The National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations said Canada's Constitution doesn't recognize First Peoples as distinct societies now, and it should. It's not really a, a fight over words. Not at all. It's a fight about want, wanting to be different, to preserve that ability to remain different from other societies in Canada. The problem is that if you recognize only one aspect of our society as, within Canadian society as being distinct from the rest, then you're, you're then implying that the rest are not distinct. And when uh, we are forced to take other words, uh, we become combative too because uh, you're challenging us, challenging us to, to agree that there can be a copyright to words in the Constitution. And then you, when, you, when you challenge us to find other words, you, you create a new debate that's, that shouldn't be there at all. Mercury claimed that with a little understanding on both sides, 
there can be a solution to this stare down between Quebec and natives over the words distinct and society. I think the spirit that we should go into the room with is sharing. We have to learn to share with each other a common vision for Canada, but also we have to learn to share with, with each other in terms of benefits from belonging to a common society. And one of those things we can share quite easily is the worst distinct society. Good morning. We, we are ready to start the session. How far the spirit of sharing will go in shaping the outcome of this current round of constitutional bargaining should be known in the next few weeks. But Manitoba's Elijah Harper told the closing plenary that constitution framers could do worse than look to the first peoples for inspiration. Elijah Harper. I know as Aboriginal people, we believe holistic in terms of principles and philosophy of how this country should be developed. Many of our principles lie out in the wilderness, the vast resources of this country. There lies our principles, the peace, the tranquility, the harmony that we must live together and adopt those principles. The Aboriginal groups were determined to appear united in their quest for inherent self-government. And certainly none of them spoke out against that. But a few Aboriginal women wanted to make sure that inherent self-government would be subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that led to quite a heated debate. Here now is Karen Webb on a theme that was a constant undercurrent to the weekend's discussions. The Native Women's Association came to this weekend conference determined to make women's rights an Aboriginal issue. Whether it be freedom of religion, freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom from discrimination, or any other basic rights guaranteed by the Charter, we say that citizens of our First Nations have the right to live in their communities free of the dark shadow of fear and abuse. The question for many women is whether Aboriginal governments would be subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Many of them remember the fight over Bill C-31, the law that changed the Indian Act and allowed many women to regain their status as Indians. They say the equality rights in Section 15 of the Charter supported them when male chiefs did not. For us, Article 15 in 1985, that's what amended the Indian Act. It was the Canadian Charter of Rights. Then Bill C-31 was accepted and passed, and it was enforced on communities to take back their sisters. That's why we have questions now. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about protection. And what we've seen so far is the Canadian Charter of Rights. That's all we know. And self-government for all of us is going into something that we don't know about. And we want protection, and we don't want to wait tomorrow. We want it now. But support for the Charter isn't universal. Many women say they don't want the Charter to interfere with traditional forms of Aboriginal government. As a traditional Clinkett person, something that was said in a meeting this morning before we arrived here, an Indian woman elder said, I am not going to take a step down by allowing Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights to apply to me. Because Aboriginal women in the traditional systems have a very high and respected role. My name is Joan Coe and I'd like to add They believe women will have more rights under traditional governments than they do now. What I want to do is I want my collective rights protected. I want Aboriginal people to all be in one canoe so that we can protect each other. That's what makes us different from an adversarial process. The Charter, I see it as a triangle, with the state at the top, the plaintiff and the defendant each at one corner, and everyone fighting on that triangle to protect their rights, their individual interests. We want our collective circle enshrined through this process somehow, and if I can't get that, then I don't want to be a part of it. I was born Indian, but the Native Women's Association pressed Indian. on. I challenge our male leaders here today, when you're talking about tradition and cultures, what was the role of the Aboriginal women years ago? It was the Aboriginal women that were the leaders in the community, that were the backbone of that community, that were the heart of the community. And look at us today as Aboriginal women, and it's a very sad state. Winnie Giesbeck issued a challenge to male leaders about their position on women. And it just so happens, my name wouldn't be fast guy if it wasn't for my mother. Because in my nation, which is traditional government is being exerted and exercised. The women are the ones who determine who we are. 
And as the leader of the National Association called the Native Council of Canada, I couldn't ignore the rights of women. The Assembly of First Nations has proposed an Aboriginal Charter of Rights instead of the Canadian Charter. There's an option, a better option than the imposition of a Charter of Rights devised by a society that is not sure about it. We're providing the option. We're saying we can create a better Charter of Rights and Freedoms by working together to accomplish that objective. So what's wrong with that option? I'm Ojibwe. Twenty years ago, before the Charter of Rights existed, Jeanette Cormier-Laval tried to challenge the law that declared her to be non-Indian. The government, supported by native leaders, fought her. She lost. She says an Aboriginal charter is an option only for the future. In cooperation with the Assembly of First Nations, assurances from Grand Chief Ovid Mercury, who says that he will be inclusive, he will work with us, that uh, we don't see any reason that the charter will have to be used, but until such time as an Aboriginal charter is drawn up, that we have to have this as an interim measure. It was just six months ago that the federal government was saying it could be ten years before Aboriginal Canadians achieve self-government. Now the major Aboriginal groups are involved in a ten-week process that could lead to self-government as soon as there is a new constitutional deal. But despite the optimism with the speeded up process, and despite the optimism at the conference this weekend, there are still questions with which Aboriginal people do not want to deal. Questions that other Canadians want answers to. Here's Wendy Mesley. Saturday night and the delegates relax after a day of heavy discussion. They all came to the conference to help build a new relationship. Canadian Aboriginals have wanted one for years, and now the polls show non-Aboriginal Canadians agree it's time to right some old wrongs. I can't believe it. I, I, I know it's more than I expected. But what is it they're really uh, agreeing on? The uh, longer we go on, the more questions I have. Just a few months ago, Joe Clark said the government would not entrench self-government in the Constitution unless there was agreement on what it meant. But that's not what Clark is saying now. Uh, the idea has been that a general principle would be established and there would then be, uh, be specific uh, negotiations or specific court decisions. CEI's Joe Giz says a lot of premiers could live with that, but that some others worry it would create another level of government without first knowing what power it would have. Is it uh, a right uh, that stands uh, without any definition whatsoever? Are there any limits on the exercise of the right? If so, uh, what are those limits? This weekend, Ovid Mercury spelled out what he thinks self-government would be. We're looking for more powers than any municipal level of government, obviously and equal powers uh, as those exercised by the provinces. But Mercury says Aboriginals will only start negotiating the details after the basic right to self-government has been recognized in the Constitution. We need some self-respect to get to the negotiating table. Without that, we'll be at the mercy of, of uh, politicians or officials of government that can delay negotiations indefinitely. And he says different native groups will ask for very different forms of self-government. Chairman of Manitoba's Aboriginal Constitutional Committee, Wally Fox Deason, says his province could probably accept recognizing self-government and then negotiating a series of deals, but he says it will be difficult. I mean, if you really want to take it to its, uh, to its uh, possible extreme, you could be talking about 600 different pieces that fit into a puzzle that uh, in its total you describe as Aboriginal self-government because you've got over 600 Aboriginal communities in the country. This Quebec businessman says it'll be a tougher sell in Quebec, that that government will want more details before it agrees to any negotiations on self-government. You cannot have in the Constitution an open-ended power that you don't know what it means. David Elton of the Canada West Foundation says he has no problem with the concept of self-government, but he predicts that once the real negotiations start, they'll be extremely difficult. According to the Aboriginal people, we are standing on Algonquin territory. Well, according to me, we're standing in the House of Commons, 
and that has a very different meaning to me than it does to Aboriginal people. And that has got to be worked out. Because Elton says another area of potential conflict is the debate over whether the Charter of Rights should apply to native governments too. Because we have this idea about certain basic individual rights that everyone should have regardless of their ethnicity and regardless of their gender. And I hope they don't try and ask us to change those kinds of things because I don't think we're capable of doing that. Native MP Ethel Blondin says they can and will work out a compromise. We can do it and we will do it. We just need a little bit of time. And the clock is ticking, the government is putting pressure on us. It's creating kind of a frenzy and a panic, but I don't think that our leadership is silly enough to fall into that pattern. Inuit leader Rosemary Kuptana says all Aboriginals know that the support they enjoy now for the right to govern themselves may not last forever. This is the critical time in which um, Aboriginal people uh, can make their case and uh, if we don't receive the kind of constitutional amendment uh, that we are seeking or that we can negotiate I don't know if there will be another time uh, in the future. Tomorrow, Joe Clark will meet with Native women about their concerns over the Charter. But first, in a private chat with Ovid Mercury, Clark sought and got the Chief's approval to meet separately with the women's delegation. Okay. It was another sign of just how carefully the federal government is handling its new relationship with Aboriginal Canadians. Well, Wendy, by the end of the conference, the Aboriginal leadership seemed to feel they had their message out, it was being understood, and the conference was a big success. Well, and part of what they're happy about is the huge change in dynamics just in their relationship with the federal government. Remember the last round, the Meech Lake round, where the, the premiers and the prime minister were on the inside, behind closed doors, figuring out our constitutional future, while Aboriginal Canadians were demonstrating outside, not part of the process. Now they've had this conference. They've also been invited to go in and sit at that table for future uh, negotiations. A huge change. Well, remember, they were invited in to take part in this 10-week process on the constitutional consensus, but they asked to be invited, and now they'll have to play by different rules. The Aboriginal leadership originally didn't want to be part of these conferences because they wanted to play by their own rules. Now they're in at the table, they're negotiating, and they've been told if you're going to be a negotiator, you're going to have to learn how to compromise. Well, and there's a lot uh, that still has to be worked out. First of all, does inherent self-government get written into the Constitution? Do all the premiers agree to that? Meeting starting over the next uh, week or two, next week, the first one. Uh, and they only have until the end of May to work this out. And then after that, a uh, number of indications of just how tough the negotiations are going to be and a lot of people already wanting to put limits on what some of the Aboriginal leaders are asking for. Well, you are, Wendy. Well, that concludes our coverage of the special conference on Aboriginal issues and the Constitution. For Wendy Mesley, I'm Don Newman in Ottawa. Thanks for being with us, and good night from the nation's capital.